back to the Independent Investor Channel. We're coming into earnings week this week for Highland Holdings. Give you an update here. Get some of my thoughts and, and forecasts here on what to expect, um, what I'm going to be looking at on the upcoming uh, earnings, where we currently are in the current environment, and offer my closing thoughts here. Uh, before we get started, I, I do want to comment on the Stephen Tobin uh, article that came out this week. Um, found it to be uh, surgically timed for sure. Uh, right before earnings call. Um, I, I thought it was a, a, a well-written article. Um, with that said, there was some areas of, of really some overreach uh, for sure from Mr. Tobin. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I enjoyed the read. I, I think we get a little bit too hypersensitive around, you know, a, a understanding a piece that's put out there that I, I thought was sourced well. Um, I thought that there was some convenient... Um, uh, um, omissions <laughs> to, to some of the, the facts out there. Um, and, and that's, that's okay. Uh, you know, this, this is, um, one of those situations where everybody's entitled to, um, what they want to say, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm hungry for any information. And we still seem to be in a landscape where Hylion is being very close to the best with regards to the information that they release. I, I think that's unfortunate. I, I think it speaks to um, the, the, the desolate landscape that we are in right now with regard to infor information and, and pushing those timelines to the right. Um, and, and we just don't have a lot. Um, but, um, you know, I, I thought a couple of things to take away from me, and I, I do uh, encourage you guys to all read the article. I know some of the folks in the discard. I know Rick commented at the bottom um, and, and also the real Christopher, who I have the utmost respect for um, in their uh, holistic understanding of Hylion. And that's what it takes to invest in this company. Let's be real. Um, we're, we're investing on paradigm shifts in the industry. Um, that, that's for, for, for certain. Whether or not Hylion is going to be the sole dominant player in the industry um, or, or a, a participant in the paradigm shift is, is yet to be seen. And I think um, making premature predictions, as Mr. Tobin seemed to imply in the article, um, is probably in, in some accounts irresponsible. And I think I, I don't question um, whether or not there's a motive or not um, I, you know, I, I think he's, he's doing his job as a writer to generate churn um, in, in, an, in a, an environment where if I was going to pulse the thirst of, of highly on enthusiasts, I would say that most of us are thirsty for information. And I think there's uh, some somewhat of some susceptibility there by putting out any information at all uh, to to try to garner a reaction. And, and certainly there was some reactions there um, to Mr. Tobin's presumptions on the cash burn uh, seemingly um, um, saying that the, the company in 2022 is, is going to have is going to run out of money. Um, this is not true. Um, this is uh, part of what the overreach uh, and a good writer is one that is going to step over the line uh, in order to uh, generate churn. You know, those articles that are just completely fact based and statistically uh, backed, nobody reads those. OK, people want to read controversy and, and, and they want to disagree and they want to engage in the conversation. And um, th those those presumptions are, are made with a, a singular objective to generate churn. That's it. Um, Mr. Tobin understands that Hylion's not going to run out of money in 2022. Um, he came out with an elegant spreadsheet that he manipulated the numbers to provide um, some percentage of, of increases where I just, it, it's, it's mathematically impossible um, to, to come to the realization that those percentages of increases uh, across the board are, are going to render Hylion um, insolvent at the end of 2022. It's impossible. Sitting on 485 million of accessible cash, left out a huge, huge swath of accessible cash. Hylion's not going to burn all of their cash buckets all at the same time. They may draw upon them. Right, but strategic initiatives to draw down their cash burn, as indicated on the Q3 call uh, last time around, from a projected 120 to 130 to around 110, um, puts them at about a 25 million on the low end, 27 and a half million per quarter burn. Um, I just don't see it happen, and I, I don't see this company frivolously burning through money. I don't know where Nicola and Hyzon, which Nicola was seemingly again put on a pedestal for everything that they do as gospel. Um, I guess that's what it takes. Just lie your way to the front until you can 
uh, you know, uh, make it, fake it until you make it, right? Um, I, I, I just find it interesting, you know, with with the range that Nicola is declaring, they've, they're already being dubbed the winner. At least you would get that impression by reading through Stephen Tobin's article um, talking about, you know, the, you know, the 350 miles of, of range in quotations, which means those are unproven uh, statistics and that they've already got sales out there and they're already r- running product. It's, it's interesting not to identify the real drawbacks with Nikola being also an unproven technology. Uh, and um, to, to dub them the winners right now, which the article seemingly implied, I may have got the wrong impression. And Stephen seemingly has a response for everybody. If you read the comments, you know, um, he, he, he did comment back, which I give credit for. Um, but there was some staunch uh, disagreements with his presumptions in the article. And it, it was very presumptuous. There's no doubt about it. The second was um, that they would sell nothing. Um, that, that was a far cry to focus in on a product that is not ready for sale and saying that they won't sell said product. I, I, I found that interesting. And to bridge the gap between what was previously dis- disclosed as far as sales projections and, and making the connection now that they won't meet those projections without providing any context around those missed sales, i.e. supply chain issues and shifting uh, the the schedule to the right that that's a normal occurrence guys um, that happens <laughs> if you think for a second that every company out there when they release the best information that they have at the time and then po- political or the environment changes um, that would impact those uh, meetings of those timelines uh, can change I, that's very unfair to uh, make those assumptions uh, on a product that, Basically, Mr. Tobin is making the conclusion that um, they're not going to sell uh, the product. And it's, it's kind of like a no kidding. It, by, by saying that if they score less runs in a baseball game than the other team, that they're going to lose the game it is kind of just speaking the obvious. Um, and, and it ignores the fact that Hylion has its EX product that's been validated um, over many, many years. Um, coming to a head here. And, and I found the article, uh, the timing of the article to be somewhat suspect as well. Um, I, I think, you know, coming out with it just a, a week before earnings, uh, nobody's buying the stock right here. Um, nobody's selling the stock. Uh, institutions are continuing to add to positions and uh, r- really trying to um, manage positions. There's a little bit of trimming going on coming into earnings because um, there's a big question mark surrounding these earnings that are about to hit the books here in Q4. Um, my expectations are at zero. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, what, what's going to happen. And, and it just goes along with my bucket of, uh, you know, for a lack of better terms, frustration in, in owning this company. Um, it, it's really tough to have the conviction that I have um, in the prospects of what it's trying to achieve in their vision um, and how things have transpired up to this point. And I'll speak about that at the end of my video with regard to where I think we are currently in this current landscape. And the, the the last the last thing that Mr. Tobin said in the in the article that I thought was uh, really interesting is he kept saying that Hylion has no sales. Um, I, I find that to be uh, very misleading, in that technically, okay, Hylion has no sales, okay, but I think you need to back that up and say that they have fifteen hundred ninety orders. Uh, of back orders that need to incur a file final sales agreement with these companies. So when you dig below the surface, it's more than nothing. And by saying it's nothing and then leaving it open-ended like that makes readers uh, that don't understand the Hylian story understand that they have multiple orders and these orders aren't to be discredited. Agility is one of the largest shipping and logistics companies in the world. It's just not to be understated. The 250 orders that have been put through by ANG represents the the, the shift and move in sentiment toward uh, renewable natural gas and the very fueling infrastructure that's going to be used to put that RNG through or the CNG to whatever trucks are needing that service 
over the long term. So it's really a play on the existing infrastructure. It's not so much about the 250, although I do think that that's a, a bullish signal for Hylion. I think that's a real positive, but I think it's a stretch from the truth to say that they have zero sales. Okay. These are non-binding orders. So technically Mr. Tobin is right, but I understand what he's trying to do and generate that churn and provide for that controversy within the article. Um, it was smartly done. Um, I thought it was a well-written article. I just thought that as a highly on bull in the company, I thought it was um, suspect in its timing. Um, and, and I thought some of the presumptions that I've laid forward for you guys were really something to question is re really false. That they're just, that they're not going to play out in reality. And he tried to backtrack at the end of the article by offering a more realistic, he called it a, a less bearish thesis. Um, and I did appreciate that. But the damage had kind of been done in the top end of the article when I read through it. And, you know, a lot of the comments pick, picked him apart in multiple capacities, just like they did on the first article, um, which was a very successful article for the author. So it's no surprise to me why the author doubled down um, on putting out a follow up to that article um, by, by really doubling down on what I feel like is a fairly vulnerable uh, community right now. There's nothing, nothing in way of sentiment that is going to allow investors to rely on a stock price that has gone down peak to trough 90% uh, over the previous year. It, it's just that simple. And then that's why I say it's somewhat vulnerable and it's really kind of exploiting said vulnerabil vulnerabilities um, by the timeliness of the article. Now, it, you know, I'm hoping that Hylion blows out the number. I, I really do. I hope they say something. I hope they have a rabbit up their, up their sleeve. Hope, hope, hope. Uh, you know, this is no way to invest. There's no way. Um, this is speculating at this point. There's no doubt about it. And I'm hanging in there in the pocket for you guys. But I'm also trying to be realistic as well with how bad. Um, the situation is with regard to the position and the lens of how Hylion is looked at in the eyes of the stock market. Now, my questions will, being, will be being posed here. Um, I had J-Mac investing on last Friday. He invited the opportunity for us to offer a couple of comments uh, to Thomas, one on behalf of myself, one on behalf of the community, because, you know, he said some kind words. He said, look, you know, Ryan, you're, you're kind of a leader. In, in putting out highly on content, you know, that that's all great and plenty, guys. I, I really appreciate that. But it's a lot more simple than that. It really is. Um, I, I think this is a, sh a shift, a paradigm shift away from traditional uh, reliance upon a diesel industry over the last hundred years. And the, and the said industry has been built and predicated upon um, that as the fuel of choice, and it still is 90% dominated in fuel. And, and I think the timing is now to start that paradigm shift. Is it going to happen overnight? Absolutely not. It's not. But I, I think education is the key. I think education through awareness is the key. And if I can provide that small piece of education, certainly there's other channels that are providing fantastic awareness and even go so far as to say product validation in the field, you know, drive mixed game doing a good job and some of the other YouTube channels, Wall Street Engineer, Rat Pack Stocks, J Mac Investing, uh, as well as uh, uh, RP Music. So th those are some of the few and, and a couple others, uh, 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 Dividend Bloodhound doing a good job too. I'm, I'm trying to think of everybody because because um, I, I don't mean to omit those folks out there that are putting out um, some some uh, um, some content on highly on. I try to do it on a frequent weekly basis because I think the uh, the awareness and the education pieces is crucial uh, at this point with regard to understanding a holistic opportunity. Which, when you read an article like Stephen Tobin has put forward, um, it it, it kind of leaves out the thesis of what type of environment we're stepping into and puts Hylion in a box to say that if Hylion burns all of its cash and it doesn't sell anything, it's going to zero. I, I'm not really sure I understand how, um, how productive that is. Uh, and it, it's really going to be extremely fulfilling for um, those folks to eat crow uh, in a good way. I, I, I think the world is a better place with solutions like Hylion and many others, Nicola, and, and Hyzon, uh, I'm critical of them. I'm, I'm critical of Hylion as well. But these changes and shifts in sentiment need to happen. 
if you've ever been to Southern California, you know, I, I believe it's, it's, it's a special place. I, I, I used to work down there in the port of LA. I used to work right there at Terminal Island, you know, right there in San Pedro. I used to work right there. And I had a good buddy of mine say, you know, it's not smog, Ryan. It's a, it's a marine layer. You know, I'm like, I'm from Oregon and we don't have marine layers, nor do we have smog that is constantly around. And, and it's almost as if you're in a dream. Um, it's really sad. And, and that is specifically um, to our number one polluter on this earth. And I, I think when Mr. Tobin writes an article like that, it, it, it fails to acknowledge the potential. Now, these things might not happen in reality, just like as he implies that Hylian is going to burn through 600 million in cash in one year, you know, cash and cash equivalents, right? Um, that, that somehow the government is not looking at this problem, that the industry might drive some of these solutions forward, that the very industry that Hylian is looking to serve is not looked at as an enemy in this, rather a partner in this whole thing. And what gets missed all the time when talking about Hylion is not only the companies that are looking to revolutionize and provide solutions to the marketplace to said fleets, what gets missed all the time is the customers of said fleets who are also very important in having a voice in this initiative going forward um, to make sure that it's, it's kind of a shared responsibility. Um, I, I think there's going to be some incentives there that we cannot quantify right now as bullish shareholders in the company, okay? Hylion is probably on a lot of different avenues with regard to some of those catalysts. I, I talked about the TERP program last time. That's the state-driven uh, incentive program for some of these companies to step in and take their old equipment and upgrade them with uh, products that Hylion has available to the open marketplace right now. Those products could be put in the hands of fleets for almost free of charge or at least a significant uh, percentage of discount um, through going through the TERP program. And that's a state-run program uh, for environmental standards and quality and taking old uh, 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 equipment uh, and, and replacing them with newer uh, um, uh, products uh, that are uh, less harmful to the environment. And that's on the state level. And then you've got the federal government um, with regard to incentives. And, you know, if nothing else, he pointed out the 120, 120 million of ZEV credit uh, that uh, Nicola has uh, achieved its certification for. Um, I think that's a win for the industry. Hylion has not achieved their CARB approval and OSHA and EPA certifications, but, but is, it, is it suffice it to say that they're not going to achieve those certifications into the future? I, I, I think it's, it's a, a, a testament to the industry as a whole. And, and Nicola was first to market for, for them to kind of you know, be that trailblazing company that it, that achieves that and, and is actually, you know, being awarded these $120 million credits to the customers that, uh, that, that get their, their products. If nothing else for me, that validates that Hylion is on the right track, that those incentives are out there on the horizon to be had, right? Is the company going to run out of money over the next year and be ineligible to reach what we know in reality, to be there on the horizon to pursue in way of state and uh, federal government uh, incentives for the initiative that we're looking to step into, right, and address what I feel like is a, a huge problem in the transportation industry. And I don't think Hylian is going at this alone. I don't think that there's not a shared responsibility from the very fleet owners looking to put these solutions to work for themselves. And, and I think there's an undercurrent of support there that is really difficult to quantify, but it is absolutely part of my bullish thesis to say that if patience is what is ne the necessary ingredient at this point to put into this equation to allow some of these things to transpire over the short to medium term, I'm totally willing to do that because I think this is going to be a multi-year rollout um, of, of uh, introducing the marketplace or really getting that cooperative uh, engagement with fleets and customers as Hylion really starts to integrate with 
uh, the um, the fleets out there. Now, my question, and I would uh, encourage you guys to pay attention, it's probably going to be rolled out through JMAC Investing and asked directly of Thomas Healy on my behalf. So I'm really stoked that I'm getting my questions um, put, put to Thomas. Um, I, I would like it to be me that asks the question because I I'm pretty good at framing my intent. It's a little more difficult when somebody takes somebody else's question and they try to pose it. Jason will do a good job, but but to frame it in a way uh, to pulse in with Thomas and understand what's going on on the OEM hub front, um, that is the key to mass scale. And that is the key from going to, from low volume production to uh, a mass scale up and, and, and production. And, and if he can allude to any type of progress that's being made with any of the other OEMs out there other than Peterbilt, I think that's going to be a huge catalyst. That, that for me, guys, is number one. It is number one. This is all for naught if they cannot integrate. They will not be able to produce mass scale um, in, in their evolution and provide that breaking point from low volume to high volume production sales if they can't integrate and get the OEM hubs stood up and, and get these folks in agreement with them. Now, it's more of a cold type of call right now because what I foresee happening is this, and this is actually in the investor presentation, the original one, okay, where there's churn provided in the marketplace, test units are put out to the fleets, the fleets love it. The fleets love it. It performs well. They get to do their internal validation on it, run the numbers for themselves and understand, look, this it solves everything that the industry is asking for uh, at this point um, with regard to reducing charging time, with regard to providing that bottom line uh, uh, payload increase right, which is a problem of the BEV community right now, never gets talked about. Thomas Healy just tweeted it this week, and I don't think a lot of people picked up on that. If you imagine an electric truck rolling down the road and going up a hill, it's going to burn more power off of just a standalone battery system, and those charges and ranges are going to be affected by that if you don't have an onboard solution to recharge that battery. I'm not really sure why it's so crystal clear to me as to why that makes so much sense, but if you're going on a standalone type of an application, you're going to burn that battery quicker and it's going to reach re require you to find that charging station. It's going to uh, require you to find the charging station more often. And I would go one further and double down on Thomas's uh, really tweet of emphasis on the deficiency of the BEV application. And that is the capability of the battery system as the system ages over time. Um, there's no battery that gets better over time. It gets worse over time, okay? And it starts to degrade in its ability to hold a charge. That That's just realistic application if you think about it. And you think about these companies that are deploying these full BEV applications, it, it would be interesting to me what the useful life of the battery system would be over its forecasted life, let's say seven to in some cases 10 years, um, which is the time frame of owning the asset that they're using to, um, to to find that bottom line total cost of ownership, right? So so really important there. On the upcoming earnings, I just wanna go over a couple of things that I'll be looking for EX sales. I've already talked about this on my sales video. I, I, I talked about the 35 that should be on the books uh, from last year. So that's 12 months from last year to as I'm releasing this video here, February 20th, a couple days before this Q4 earnings to close out 2021 years in December uh, 31st of 2021. So it'll be nice to put that in the, in the, in the, in the books and, and get it taken care of. Um, but the EX sales is something that I'm going to be interested in. Stephen Tobin talked about the projected sales for 2022. I, I thought that was interesting because I thought my video was much more in detail on addressing highly on acknowledging that it was going to be low volume for a while on the onset. And 2021 only forecasted 3,000 units. It was supposed to jump up to 4,100 units uh, in 2022. So I, I think between the lines is where you need to focus in that 
Hylion is projecting a catalyst increase at some point. And I think that catalyst increase is why I'm asking the question that I am on the OEM hubs. It's, it's, it's very specific to that. And I believe that to be the very catalyst um, that, that we're talking about once these products are available and in, in the hands of the customers, the customers are going to put that uh, kind of that back pressure uh, on the OEMs specifically uh, to allow these products to be turned out off of the OEM lines. And that's where those discussions will really get serious and deals will start to get inked to where those OEM hubs will come to reality. My question to Thomas is specific to any progress that's being made on that front. But EX sales, are they going to come out with 150, which would be half of the 2021 projections? Now, if it's half of the 2021 projections in, uh, in the face of everything that's gone on over the last six months uh, to, to one year would be remarkable with supply chain issues and Hylion's ability to, uh, to, to deal with those, circumvent those uh, uh, real headwinds. I think it's been a really tough environment, and I, I think that's going to be important to focus in on. Is it going to be 89? Is it going to be 50? Is it going to be 35? Uh, I, I, you know, if it's close to that projection that was turned out, um, as far as units in the hands of customers, there's customers all over. You know, I see all the time. Warner's a customer, a hybrid customer. You know, Return It is a hybrid customer. You know, all these companies, uh, you know, that CR England was an old hybrid customer, customer here, customer there, these hybrid units sent up to the Northwest for testing and validation. You know, did they purchase follow on orders? Did, did Oregon come through and provide any grant in incentive for them? You know, a lot of these companies, you know, hey, they're hybrid products, ideally, right? I just can keep going and going and going. And across all of these fleets that represent many, many tractors out there on the road, I find it hard to believe that they're going to report 35. Now I'm looking in between 35 and 150, 150 on the top end would, would, would be ex extremely bullish for me if they could realize half of what those projections were in 2021 and 2022 is a new year. It just started. So again, I found that a little bit presumptuous and that we're not, we're just finalizing two months into the new year. And with the geopolitical risk going on right now, inflation rates on the rise, stock market fear has crept back into the market. I just thought it was a, it was suspect uh, with regard to the timing of the article, but you know, good on him for playing the game. And that's typically what it's all about. Uh, and that's typically why I come out with the independent investor channel. I identified this week um, as my voice as being the number one asset uh, of my channel. It's just that simple because when I come at, read articles like that, we as a community have a voice to fight back. And it was nice to see Rick and Christopher actually on there uh, challenging those notions in the article because some of them, I'm trying to be nice here, some of those presumptions were, were just wrong. They were just wrong. Um, and I, were, were, they, were they not true? Were they untruths? It doesn't matter anymore, you know? People come out and they say as scathing as a thing as they possibly can to make themselves, you know, make make themselves known, uh, to provide themselves notoriety. You know, um, this is the wheelie house that you have to work on. And I, I think Stephen Tobin would love to have the opportunity to have an audience like me. Um, he doesn't. It's mine. <laughs> this is me. Um, and perhaps maybe it's an attempt to generate churn for himself. I don't know. I'm not going to speak to the motives of uh, the individual. All I can do is go off of the merits of the article that I read uh, and criticize uh, and or compliment as appropriate. Okay. Um, hiring going into the earnings is going to be of interest to me. Um, they've been on a hiring spree the last three, four weeks. It's been impressive. Um, and that is the question that made it uh, uh, on behalf of the independent investor community is speaks along the lines of what I feel like when Thomas Healy is forward with some of these um, bullish improvements in the company, hiring being one of them. OK, um, new relationships with companies, rollout of Media Day, all these things, right, speaks to a bullish conviction for the future right? It's bullish, bullish. I've never seen Thomas stray away from what he believes to be um, his vision for uh, reducing the um, carbon emissions uh, through the burning of 
um, uh, uh, renewable natural gas and, and, and burning of methane to provide that fuel rather than off gas it into the atmosphere. He, he's steadfast in this mission. So he's hiring new, new uh, product developments, you know, um, uh, testing on the horizon, things like that, that he's always foot stomping. Okay. And it defines that bullish thesis, I think, with highly on holdings. Okay. The question is specific to the disconnect between that bullish conviction. What allows Thomas Healy to arrive and define that bullish conviction for him and the company that he represents in the face of a stock market that is pricing highly on at liquidation value at best? So my question is, in lieu of the disconnect between those two things, what is he hearing from industry? What is he hearing from the government? What is he hearing from fleet customers? What is he seeing in way of competition that can help him arrive at this bullish thesis and remain so steadfast on it in light of or in the face of a stock market that is valuing the company right now at liquidation? Okay. The disconnect between the two are very, very real. And so my question to Thomas is um, to have him speak on what gives him that bullish conviction going forward, what defines that. And I want him to speak on what he's hearing behind the scenes, you know, what he's hearing from the needs of customers, what he's hearing from the needs of fleets. Is range anxiety a, a thing? Is everybody just going to fall off tilt and go full Bev? Hylian's done, if that's the case. They're not a Bev company. Okay. They are a powertrain uh, company, an electric powertrain company that brings the charging mechanism with them. Okay. They are not one of those things that are going to rely on the infrastructure outside of the fuel that fuels the onboard generator, that fuels the proprietary battery system, that drives the electric motor, that drives the rear axle. Okay. What defines that bullish thesis? What he's hearing to help him arrive at that bullish thesis? To, to, to have him be so steadfast on continuing the hiring, continuing the ad, adding, additions to the upper management and the additions to uh, the board of governance as well. So that speaks to the second question that we're going to um, hopefully get posed when Jason goes down there um, and, and represents the community and has the opportunity to tour the plant. Uh, sit down with the CEO and ask him those questions. So it'll be interesting to see the renderings uh, from that. And I'm, I'm hoping for some good stuff. I'll be closely monitoring amended timelines going forward. Um, the timelines uh, were horrible <laughs> on the Q3. They were bad. Um, extending into 2023 here, winter testing and validation, which I just don't understand what I can't do now. Drive them up north to Canada. I'm sure they can find some snow. I'm sure there's some snow in Wisconsin. Go to the UP in Michigan. Do what you got to do. Um, and I, I, I just, I, I don't understand. It's, it's a real it's a real constructive criticism that I have on this is that are they in a hurry to get this done? It just doesn't seem like there's any, there's any angst, that there's any rush to do anything. And I'm, I'm not saying rush as if to do it carelessly. I'm just saying that in business, you have to run at the speed of business. You're, you're always pressed whether or not you like it or not. That's the environment. If you want to come in and just tiptoe through the tulips and blase about everything that you do, and I'm not saying highly on is, I'm saying that the perception is there because there's criticisms put out there over the environment to say, geez, isn't there an alternative solution? Are you even identifying alternative solutions or are you just tuck and tail when you can't meet your primary objective and just saying to hell with it, we'll do it next year. To hell with it, we'll do it next year. Are we going to be next year and you're just going to use the same, well, we're going to do it next year. If you do that in business, you're done. Ma the majority of your business is going to be made on the fringes where you're having to identify alternative strategies to make the vision a reality. It's just that simple. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm so satisfied uh, on the sense of urgency with, with Hylian at this particular point. So the amendment to the timelines is going to be key for me. Maybe even moving it to the left a little bit would be a little bit more of a catalyst to say, look, we can deliver. We previously said this. Now we can kind of over deliver on those promises and make it maybe sooner than later. <laughs> That's a strategy um, that can be put out there. And if played correctly, can work to your favor. If played correctly in that those timeframes hurt the stock bad. 
the stock really, really sold off after the last earnings. And we we're down to four bullets left. I mean, we're going to be down to, you know, 25 cents if they're not careful. I, I just don't know how long they're going to play the game or if they're even playing the game at this point, or if they're basically just saying it cannot happen sooner than what we're projecting. And I just in business that that's not reality. Things change so dynamically from quarter to quarter that I'm looking for an update to the, 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 the positive. I'm looking for some positive news this time. We got enough negative news on the Q3 call. I'm looking for some actual good news here. We're highly on starting to pull this crap together, and they're starting to connect the dots with the networks that they put in place to work for them. Board of directors specifically is what I'm talking about. Hiring these sales directors that are doing what? Do something. Okay, start connecting the dots. You should be on the phone with Amazon every single day, every day. Have them deny you the ability to talk to them about your solution. Very well, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Hang up the phone, call them directly. Everybody wants to resort to this email garbage. You want to know what email does for a lot of people? It gives you a cop out. It does. Well, I emailed them. I contacted, really? When was the last time you flew in there for a, be a meeting? Fly into Amazon corporate, all right? If you're, if you're highly on holdings and you're a publicly traded company, you can garner a, a meeting with anybody. <laughs> Go walk through the door. There are people to shake their hand, introduce them to the product. Very, very simple, not hard. Leave. Thank you very much. Um, you know, let me know if I don't hear from you for three days, expect to hear from me. Right. A little bit of a sense of urgency. We'll see. I'm hoping that they're doing those things. There's only one way to do it right. Uh, and there's a thousand ways to do it wrong. The right way is, does it turn out results? And as of now, Hylion has not put forward results. They haven't, okay? They just haven't. And I'm sorry for my bullish community that'll disagree with me all up and down. And yeah, they've produced all kinds of, no, they haven't. They need to sell. It's that simple. They should be solidifying the back order right now. They have 1,590. They've provided all kinds of proof that they can garner a back order of non-binding orders that should come to fruition at some point in the future. Outside of the last Monet order for 40, um, I have heard nothing. And so we, we need another big order, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 250, right, of, 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 of trucks to solidify that back order and show that there's going to be an order book to draw on to help really start to supplement that cash burn that, that Mr. Tobin did refer to there is going to be cash burn. It's just that simple. Um, the question is at what accelerated rate and what are going to be the offsets to that? You just can't say that everybody at Hylion is going to take the year off and they're not going to sell a thing and there's not going to be any progress toward going into 2023. I, it's, I don't know. I've got my two feet uh, firmly in this real world. Um, sometimes I wonder about others who write stuff like that. Uh, any new customers, of course, we're going to be looking at. Um, and then any potential developments with the Hypertruck ERX. We're not at a finalized product. It's that simple. So any product developments, any product improvement, any type of certifications that could be potentially garnered up front in, 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 in advance of them turning it out, uh, for uh, the, uh, the, the the potential for scale up and getting those fleets uh, with their trucks in hand so they can start that validation going forward. All right. The current landscape garners this. The stock price is at $4 a share. Okay. $4 a share, pretty anemic. It's embarrassing. There's nothing good about it. Um, it's bad. Uh, it's horrible. People are like, yeah, it seems like your emotion is being worn on your sleeve when you do these videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I, I, I'm not one to paint on a, a happy face and come on and, you know, talk about a company that I have 100% conviction on. Um, this, this is really, this has really been trying for me. Um, I know what to look at in companies and, and I've been wrong on this. As, according to the stock, I've been wrong. Company, I'm right, right? And it's that it speaks to that disconnect that I talk about between the two, the goings on at the company and the goings on at the, with the stock. It's just that simple. Um, currently, the environment uh, is garnering, and even with some of the geopolitical risk, diesel is at an all-time high. Um, the, the, the Russia situation in Ukraine is actually driving 
uh, uh, crude oil up uh, to uh, record highs now. Actually, records over the last, it's been really dismal. I mean, crude got down to 17 bucks a barrel there um, just a short time ago. And now this geopolitical uh, race is putting a tight, uh, tight squeeze on, uh, on oil. Uh, I believe it's a political move. I do. I, I think, and it's working. And as it always works, uh, diesel seems to be, and, and the price of Brent crude anyway, West Texas and Brent and, you know, the, the, the price of barrels of oil are, are very subject to geopolitical risk. Um, and, you know, when are we going to start to acknowledge that there are other alternatives out there? Um, the, the fact of the matter is those alternatives are there and Hylion brings one of those solutions to bear amongst many. Yes, there's competition out there, but is competition going to be the end all be all demise of this company? Not really sure why this company always has a target on its back. Uh, I have my own presumptions about why that is. Uh, it's because I think they hold the goods. That's why I think. And I think for somebody like Stephen Tobin, if he thought that the company was going to zero, then why write about it? Mm -hmm. Right. Things to think about. Um, the demand is super intense right now uh, over alternative types of solutions. So as quickly as these young technology companies can bring these technologies to bear, I think the better off will be. Um, range anxiety is very, very real. If the Hypertruck ERX can perform at 1,000 miles plus, plus of range, game over. Um, game over. You are talking about the ability to engage in long-haul trucking with a fuel that is on par diesel uh, um, uh, with the a gallon of diesel equivalent uh, for RNG, right, at, at a price that is less than that. The ability to uh, carry more payload over the long term and the ability to uh, work for those extended ranges and be good for the environment and be able to fly the flag of environmental stewardship, be awarded a carbon emission score uh, at net negative neutral. And this is, this is huge net negative zero. Um, but this, these are the huge pieces to this whole puzzle. And the range anxiety thing is huge. And that's why I don't understand the discussion right now of dubbing winners when we are just way too premature we need to allow these horses to run within the fleets and allow, you know, kinks to be worked out, the, the metrics to be run to the actual bottom line benefit to these fleets. Uh, and then finally, our current environment still renders us deficient in our charging uh, capability infrastructure. Yes, but really the downtime necessary to charge these batteries. It's just that simple. If you're going to incur 30 to 45 minutes, maybe in some cases a, a per charge, and then the time in between charges on, on an anemic range of 350, 450, even 500, whatever it is, and that 500 subject to uh, the amount of payload being carried. In other words, the payload goes up, the battery life goes down, and, and the mileage that you can run off of that battery runs down. The, this is why I'm not heavily invested in BEV. This is why I'm not heavily invested in Tesla. This is why I'm not heavily invested in those full electric solutions where I do think they'll have a place in the industry. I, I think the real focus here in investing in Hylion is you are invested in class eight right now, okay? There's some schools of thought that, I, that, that the Hylion solution could be across the board, a solution for uh, uh, mid-class, right? Uh, applications, I, I totally agree with that, totally agree. The solution is not bound just to class eight, but for right now, that is the very market that Hylion is going after. Thomas Healy has been very clear on this. We are going after long, heavy haul, tandem trailer, uh, worst case scenario for the worst environments to, to engage in long haul trucking in, and they are looking to tackle that market and put their solution in the hands of that particular transportation. My closing thoughts are really, really simple. Um, the landscape right now with the stock is horrible. It's just horrible. Um, what does that mean? Uh, 20 months of pain and suffering. Um, the stock has never went up. <laughs> I, it, outside of its fall from grace from $58, um, it has been in a channel, a downward channel for uh, many, 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 many months and going on a year, a year, year and a half. Okay. We, we, we fast forward to now. Okay. 
would you invest in the company knowing what you know now if the company had just come public and it came public at four dollars probably not you would look at this opportunity and say well it's a penny stock it's a four dollar stock and you know you must assume that because it's a a, a tiny company that it's going to fail like all the rest of them you know it seems like you spec speculative growth is really really tough because the majority of those companies, man, you invest in them and you lose money. It's just that simple. Um, but the, the flip side of the coin is if you looked at it here at $4 and you understood what the bullish uh, investors who have taken this ride with this company understand about the opportunity, it, lo it looks a, a lot more attractive when you look at it at $4 a share, which is, which is anemic. And, and I, I can't say at this point, I'm right, um, because I, as uh, up to this point, I have been wrong, wrong, and I, I wish more people would talk like me. Um, I, I I don't enjoy the whole like uh, pull pull the uh, sheets over the eyes and um, ignore the situation or not comment on it or you know, somehow you don't see the big picture, Ryan, or somehow, you know, investing uh, in, in startups is, you know, all the sayings out there are interesting. Um, I, I'm not one to blow smoke up people's ass. Okay. It's bad. It's bad. Okay. For you guys that are um, naive, for you guys that are um, uh, oblivious, um, companies do and can go out of business. They can. Okay. Some of the things that I talked about in this video with regard to highly on having a target, um, not really operating with a sense of urgency, at least that's my perspective. Other schools of thought would say you're wrong, Ryan, they are. Okay. We'll, we'll agree to disagree. Um, if I sensed that there was any progress on the landscape at all with regard to solidifying their order book or moving up timelines or winning new business, or progress on the OEM hubs, I wouldn't ask the questions. Now would I, right? But we are deficient of this information and therefore the stock has suffered immensely. And there's been some schools of thought that I think if they had been a little bit more or a lot more forthcoming, um, and, and they could be, they, they, they sure could be. Um, and, and again, this, this is just where my independent thought, and I know people who watch my video, sometimes they cringe a little bit there. I know Rick probably sits there and he's like, yeah, I, I liked it when Ryan was talking about the vision for the future and net carbon negative and, and, and it's going to do really well in class A. I, I get that. It's, it's reassuring when people hear that. The reality in stock market investing is, is a staunch reality, staunch that business requires you to operate at a certain level. It requires you to do certain things if you're going to play with the big boys. And there are companies that I cover that have $30 million market caps that make more money than Hylion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I sit with CEOs every week um, and they're starving. They're hungry. They are up all hours of the day and all hours of the night. Why? Because they believe wholeheartedly in their vision. Okay. Um, do I see that level of, of um, ambition? No, I don't. Um, do I think it's probably a lacking a character trait of the CEO? Do I think it's a deficiency? Of course not. Um, would I expect more? I don't expect anything out of anybody that they are incapable of delivering. What I'm telling you is the pedigree that is necessary to make it in business. And when I look at some of these companies that are 30 million, right? Hylion has a market cap of $750 million. And to Mr. Tobin's point, and it's one that I cannot dispute technically, they have sold zero up to this point. Don't you think that that would maybe generate some anxiety? Don't you think that that would generate some level of um, ambition? <laughs> To, 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 to really make sure that you're uncovering all the stones out there on the landscape. Maybe they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And I hope, remember I used the word hope three times at the top of this video. I hope they're doing that um, for the good of the company, for the good of the mission, and specifically for the good of the stock. Because I'm one of those guys that tell you, you don't make an investment, okay, to just lose money every time. You make an investment to make money. And, and sometimes it takes 
uh, an immeasurable amount of time necessary to hold said investment to realize that end. Um, but this is, uh, this is burning at, at both ends for sure. Um, this is uh, really flickering. It's, it's smoldering. Um, all we have are, are smoldering coals at this point with regard to what has been a horrendous stock ride in 2021. And here's to better times into 2022 and especially 2023 as we look to eventually turn the corner with this company because that's what it's going to take. An eventual turn of the corner where something happens that neither I or any of the other bears or bulls in this community could have foresaw to realize the vision of this company and to rely on something other than hope, but to rely on something that is actually tangible and that we can really earmark to say, look, we're proud of this. We understood the mission before when it was at its most questionable point. And I think we are there right now. We are there right now. It is absolutely in a vulnerable stage in the company. And I'm just hoping that all of this frame the work that is publicly available with regard to the inner workings of Hylion is actually working frivolously to make sure that they can write this ship because it is writable. It is writable. It is not right right now. Okay. This is just where me and some other of my close community members, man, they may disagree with me and say they're doing everything that they can possibly do. Not bullshit. They are not. They need to do better and they know it and they can. And I believe that they will. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in the message. Make sure and subscribe to the channel. Leave your comments at the bottom of the video. Share the message. Share it on Twitter. Help me out. Share it on Facebook. Do what you got to do. Okay. Do what you got to do to share the message out there with anybody that's interested in this company, both the company and maybe and or understanding a little bit more about my psychology around the stock. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in the message and good luck in your investment future.